Welcome to the Rise to the Challenge podcast. Joined today, he's a military author, combat veteran, Harvard grad. It's John Davis. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great, Alex. I'm psyched to talk to you. We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what did you like to do growing up? I'm from the the great state of Iowa. We call it we call it heaven there. I grew up with uh, <laughs> cornfields in my backyard, and really a a great a great childhood. Um, playing outside a lot, which is something I'm you know thinking about now. How the kind of natural childhood has drifted away a little bit, you know, for kids growing up now. But I grew up playing sports, um, which was kind of the first thing I was interested in as far as challenges go. Uh, but Obviously, when you're not very good, it it can't take you very far <laughs> as far as sport challenges go. There was no Olympic challenges in my future or college athletics or anything like that. But that was my first kind of love of challenges uh, playing sports growing up. What were those sports that you liked playing? I grew up uh, wrestling, and, which was really big in Iowa. Um, we don't have any professional sports in the uh, in the whole state. So we love college sports and things. So grew up, you know, big college sports fan. And then I played football myself, but was never a very big guy. So not not very good at it. Uh, then I ran track, played soccer, kind of everything that kids do. Um, now it seems like kids, you know, because uh, my degree is in education. Now it seems like kids more specialize in sports. But when I was growing up, you play every sport. You know, you play soccer, you play baseball, you play. There's a season for everything. But in high school. I played football and wrestled. I agree with that where when I was younger, I would pl try anything because I mm -hmm. just want to play. But it seems like now, I don't know if it's parents or if it's the kid, they see a sport and they're like, I only want to play this. I'm going to get a, a, a college education offer for that sport, things like that. I want to be a professional athlete and it kind of loses the fun because they get so competitive. With all those sports you mentioned, each have their own unique skill sets. Was there ever a unique skill that pertained to you or you felt that that's where you shined, but maybe it didn't come out when you were playing it? Um, I, I grew to love boxing, actually. When I uh, graduated high school, that's kind of what I got into is because uh, I wasn't good enough to wrestle in college or anything. So I got into, I got into boxing. That's right when... Uh, martial arts was actually getting really popular kind of like early right. 2000s when it was kind of coming into the mainstream a little bit so I started boxing and that led into uh, fighting MMA so I started off fighting MMA actually uh, in local strip clubs when I graduated high school when I was going to community college so that that was kind of the start of trying to find another good challenge uh, in my life because but I never really found the right challenge until I joined the military. Did you ever imagine you would be fighting in a strip club? I that's probably something my mother's not very proud of. She's <laughs> probably more proud of the Harvard graduate thing. Than, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I I one of the things I you know I tell people a story is you everyone wants a challenge, but it's hard to find uh find the right one. Yep. And I remember after getting kind of uh you know beat up a little bit after the fight. And I was in the locker room and you're changing in there kind of with all the strippers. And one of them had to help me put my sh sweatshirt on because I was, you know, kind of banged up a little bit. And she's she's like, sweetie, maybe maybe this life isn't for you. And that's when I was like, OK, I, you know, so I got to change something like this is not going to get me anywhere worth going. As you're growing up, did you have any person that motivated you or was an inspiration in your life? Um, I think my grandmother, she has uh you know just this incredible life story to where she was one of the first women to go to like Michigan law school and she talks about some of the interesting challenges she she faced like not uh professors would refuse to call on her in class and things mm -hmm. like that and then when uh she marched with Martin Luther King in Chicago kind of like those things that you kind of leave back to history and she's like yeah i remember you know hearing Dr. King speak in person and I always thought that was pretty incredible. And then she later on in life, she went to the uh, ministry and she was the minister in my church when I was growing up, which was always kind of interesting to go and watch your grandma preach up there. So I, I, I think she was probably my greatest uh, inspiration and such a fan of education and books and things like that. It really gave me a love of reading. 
Is there anything that she said to you that you still utilize today? Yeah, she, um, so when I was in Afghanistan, I was going through some, uh, some tough, some tough times. And so I, I wrote her a letter and she has letters from her father in World War One, her, you know, uncle in World War Two, her brother in Vietnam, you know, me and uh, the Middle East, which is interesting. But I was struggling with uh, kind of seeing the things over there, especially the violence against women and obviously my combat experiences. And it was so insurmountable what we were trying to do. It felt like at the time, which was open co-ed sc schools in eastern Afghanistan so girls could go to school. And she said to me, John, don't don't worry about changing the world because that's kind of impossible anyway. Just do three things every day. One nice thing for someone you love, one nice thing for yourself, and one nice thing for a stranger. Just do those three things every day, and you'll have a good life impact. I like that because definitely in nowadays – you can make an impact in someone's life when you don't even really notice you're doing mm -hmm. that. And that's the important part mm -hmm. is it shows that you're not selfish where you're not going in where I'm going to go help this person. But sometimes you do it by accident and it makes you feel better in the long run because you can connect with that person and talk about it even in more details that maybe they were afraid to talk about it at that time. But something you said wanted them to share. Yeah. Or, you know, sometimes you don't even know the impact you have on people until yep. later. It's nice when people come back and they're like, oh, you said this to me and it really made it, you know, made a difference in my life. And that's kind of something that, um, you know, you have to remember all the time is your impact on other people. As you're growing up, what was that dream job that you were wanting? Was it always maybe be an athlete? Because you talked about going to MMA in college, but you also talked about the military. Um, when I was growing up, I think that like a lot of kids, I really had, had no idea, um, what the military did for me was it provided kind of a purpose and a direction, mm -hmm. which I didn't really have. Um, you know, I, I, I pursued community college after high school, kind of that's because that's what you're expected to do is go to college, mm -hmm. but I didn't really have a set plan. I was kind of just going to go and that's what my mother expected me to do. Um, and then I kind of just, I don't know, felt led into the military at the time. I mean, it was when kind of Afghanistan and Iraq were starting to really kick off. And I wanted, I didn't want to miss it, I think. I didn't know it was going to go on for like 20 years, but <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Is I didn't want to, you know, not participate. And I wanted a challenge. With going to community college, sometimes people go there because they can't afford and they want to really test out what do they want to do, kind of mm -hmm. give them an idea. When you were taking those classes, was nothing like sticking to, oh, I like this. And that's kind of why your direction went in a different way. Well, I think I was I was far more interested in girls and drinking than <laughs> going to class when I was that age. And because I think like a lot of people, I just wasn't really mature enough for college at 18, 19 years old. It's, you know something that takes a little bit. And then when I went back to college later on, because I always tell people, listen, I failed out of community college and now I have a graduate degree from Harvard. That's because I utilize the skills that I learned in the military that made me mm -hmm. successful at college. And one of those skills is showing up on time and showing up early. What a simple concept. And it's like the hardest thing <laughs> any college student can do. Yeah, I remember my first college class, You know, I didn't go back to college until I was 30. And my first college class, I got I got there 20 minutes early because, you know, in the military, if you're not early or late and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And eventually I start to think oh, I'm in the wrong room. This I'm, <laughs> I must be in the wrong place. And then finally, people started coming in with probably a third of the class coming in late on the first day, which is just like an unforgivable thing in military culture. But for me, doing things like showing up on time and doing the assignments kind of felt easy. Because it's just, you know, you, I can follow orders. You tell me to read something, I'm going to read it. That's how I was with college. I mean, I showed up early, like 20 minutes early every single day. And like, if I can't get into the room, I'm still going to wait outside and I'm going to do each assignment. And sometimes you, I get made fun. I'm like, why are you so serious? I go, 
that's how I grew up. Those are the work ethics that's in me. And now I look at when I'm in doing a job, it's like those skills continue even after mm -hmm. college. It doesn't just go away. You're going to show up a few minutes before a meeting or you're going to show up 10 minutes before a meeting. It's not going to go away from you. Yeah. And you show up prepared. You show yeah. up with, you know, I would have all my my pens and highlighters laid out. I have <laughs> done the the work beforehand. You know, one of my uh, the chapters of my book, which I'm sure we'll talk about, is a is about you know treating military like your or treating college like your military contract, like mm -hmm. this is your new contract. And if you take it that seriously, then there's no way you'll fail. When thinking about going into the military, what does your mind go through? Do you have a nervous feeling? Do you know what path to go? The options? Am I physically ready? Mentally ready? Emotionally ready? I um I was in a real hurry to join the military. I after I kind of figured out that's what I was gonna do, I was like, okay, well, that's that's that. And Afghanistan was really big on the news. So I went and talked to all the branches, you know, all all the branches of the military, and I said, I want to go to Afghanistan, I want to fight. At the time, I didn't even know that there were that many different kinds of jobs in the army. Like, for example, there's over 150 different types of jobs in the army. Everything from veterinary technicians to cooks to communications to satellite people. And I just thought it was you're in the army. That's just your job. You just, mm -hmm. you know, you wear the uniform, you have a gun. That's that's that. Um, and I just I went there and I said, I want to go to Afghanistan. I want to fight. And the army said to me, we'll send you to Afghanistan and we'll we'll put you in a fight. And three months later, I was in Afghanistan. I might literally shipped out right away and got to my unit and went straight to Afghanistan. Those three months before you actually went over there, were you in basic training or mm -hmm. preparing? What was that path like? So every um, in the in the army, you have your basic combat training, which is nine weeks, and then you have your job training, which is different depending on the job. So more intense technological job, you know, military intelligence, computers, longer. Mine was like five weeks long, so I did my nine weeks basic training, and then you know, which everyone goes through, and then five weeks of my job training. Then got to my unit and two weeks later i'm on the plane you know going to afghanistan feeling a little unprepared because i felt like i didn't really think it was gonna happen that fast mm -hmm. but it you know it did going off of saying that you were unprepared did it get overwhelming and you kind of second guessing the decision or you knew this was what you wanted to do and you were ready for any challenge that you were going to face i think the first um the first time i saw any combat it wasn't that scary because we were getting shot at from so far away that it almost didn't feel real. And then when I was first in my real combat situation where, you know, a, a buddy of mine got shot and there's bullets flying everywhere, then you kind of feel a little more like things are a little more serious and, th and a little over your head at times. But the military does do a good job of training and preparing you. But in, in those moments, you never really know what's going to happen. During those times in those combat situations, teamwork is definitely a big thing. How was you getting along with everyone? And did it feel like a family because you're there to protect each other? Yeah, you really have such a, I don't think there's any other profession that forms as strong of a bonds as the military does. And that's something that veterans struggle with when you get out because you lose that kind of communal identity. You really identify mm -hmm. yourself as being a part of a team, whereas the civilian life, is you know a little more indivi individualistic and you also have a measure of trust that you have to have with the people around you and you work to develop that trust you really get to know people when you're living in the same room as them you're you know kind of going through the same sacrifices and hardships and hardships can really bring people together mm -hmm. Talking about those hardships and the grueling atmosphere that's over there, how did you mentally stay focused on the task at hand? I think that you, when you're so immersed in things, it it's easy to stay focused, which is one thing that um, I found about the military was it's pretty simple. There's a scene in Forrest Gump where he, you know, the the drill sergeant says, uh, you know, what what's your job, Forrest Gump? And he says, to do whatever you tell me to do. And that's kind of the military to where I didn't have a cell phone. I wasn't worried about, you know, social media. I wasn't worried about anything like that. I was just doing my job. So staying focused um, for me on that was pretty easy. And we were getting bombed like every night with mortars coming in. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're there, you're in it. 
do you feel that has mentally made you tougher with going through those experiences with knowing that uh, bombs are going out, guns, bullets happening every day when you're out there on the battlefield? Uh, the military changes everyone, uh, you know, and kind of how that change happens is up to you and how you view your experiences. Um, I think one problem that Afghanistan veterans like me have is a, sometimes you're not really sure what it was all for, mm -hmm. which kind of leads you're kind of like, ah, you know, why did I sacrifice kind of the best years of my life, blood, sweat and tears to to this cause, which obviously a little over a year later now we pulled out. So I think not knowing our place in history kind of makes it hard to close the chapter on that. But but it's it's still something that builds resilience if you let it. But like if like any trauma, it's all eventually you get to a place of growth or you get to a place of PTSD. And my military experiences did bring out kind of the worst side of me for a little bit of my life when I first got out. But now that I've kind of been on a path of healing and helping other people, I think my bad experiences have brought out the best of me. How long was the span of your military career? A little over 10 years total. Is that usually a significant same amount that a lot of military veterans go through if they're in the army and stuff? Or were you wanting to push yourself and kind of go as far as you could go? No, it was actually 10 years, actually kind of an awkward time, because usually if you hit that point, you just do 20 to get a retirement. Mm -hmm. I actually did a uh, got a medical retirement because I was in some explosions in Afghanistan that gave me some issues with TBI and problems in my back. So um, eventually they were like, you know, you can't go back and do your job in the infantry. So we're going to offer you this medical retirement, which I took. And that's what led me into education because I was needed it, to find something else to do. <laughs> was it hard when they told you that this is the end where we're giving you that medical retirement and now you had to make that transition back into civilian life? I think by then I wanted it. So it was kind of welcome news, especially when, you know, you're dealing with these kind of physical issues. And at the time I had real bad headaches and things. So it was something that I think I was ready to move on from the military. But when I first joined, I, I fell in love with it. I couldn't see myself getting out, but kind of after doing anything, especially for 10 years, it's kind of, you kind of feel ready to start the next chapter and military life's not very stable. And also I'm someone that I, I love having freedom. Like right mm -hmm. now I live in the Dominican Republic, which is great. Um, you know, able to go wherever I want. So it's nice to be able to travel and do fun things and not be forced to go to places like Afghanistan. You mentioned a little while ago that it brought out the worst side of you when you got back into the real world. Talk about that experience. Well, I think that, you know, like I said, everyone has to kind of forge a post-military identity. And that's always not a, it's not a simple thing to do. You can't be who you were in the military mm -hmm. because that person was in a different context. And you can't be who you were before the military because that person doesn't really exist anymore. You know, whoever I was before the military is an entirely different person than who I am now. So you have to forge this new identity and kind of figuring that out is a complicated process. I went on kind of a roller coaster where um, I was given medication for my PTSD from the VA. Um, you know, I would say over me over medicated and then I self medicated with alcohol and also kind of abused the pills, um, you know, to an extent. So I think there was definitely a dark time in my life and coming back from that is what makes me want to help people who are there. Did family and friends notice a change or like the overuse of medic medication and alcohol? And did they try to do something to help you or how did they play an effect? Well, one of the kind of weird things is because when I, my problems in life didn't really come when I was in the military. They came mm -hmm. right when I got out of the military. So I was like kind of re-entering kind of civilian life and all my friends kind of lived at a distance from me and my family as well. Uh, so I was kind of alone while I was going to college because I started college when I was still in the military and then kind of stayed where I was at. So I lost my military family and was kind of disconnected from, you know, my real family and friends back home in Iowa. Um, I was living out in New York 
And that kind of isolation is really dangerous. I mean, veterans kill ourselves a lot more than the enemy kills us. So isolation and peace are, you know, arguably more dangerous than discomfort and war. With the education going back into it, you're now surrounded by a bunch of people. Did that kind of bring back like the old John and how you had that family in the military or even before the military, you kind of had that persona set of the military identity was only people thought of. Well, I, I really lucked out when I got to um, my college was because I got a great job working in a VA work study program at my school. So I got a job where I was actually helping student veterans at my campus. And that's what eventually led to want to help student veterans because that's the first place that so many people end up right when they get out of the military. Mm -hmm. And kind of the success or failure there really has a big impact on their life. A lot of people don't think too much about it, but people with college degrees kill themselves less. But it's not just as easy as you just give people college degrees and then mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, they're going to be fine. Because when veterans get to school, um, they're non-traditional students. They tend to have families. They tend to have more responsibilities. They have to work during school. And over 50% of veterans, me, myself included, have some type of service-connected disability. Talk about being at Harvard grad. Being a Harvard grad, I mean, I think when I read your profile, it was, you're not going to meet a tattooed guy being a Harvard grad. <laughs> and that kind of um, line stuck with me because it's basically taking the stereotype of a Harvard grad and making it different and changing and saying that anyone can have that opportunity to go do that. My, my tagline is I'm the most tattooed person with the Harvard that, degree. Yeah. So that's what I got on my website. And that's because... I've never met anyone with more tattoos than me that went to Harvard. And when I was there, all these professors were like, what, what are you doing here? At the time, I was riding a Harley, you know, I got <laughs> a show. Up. So it was kind of a different thing. Um, you know, I grew up in, you know, like I said, cornfields in Iowa. So Harvard was about as far away as like Hogwarts for me at the time. <laughs> so it was just, you know, a totally different thing. And my mother actually encouraged me to apply because during my undergrad, I was just getting straight A's and, you know, while I was working for this veteran program and helping other people really helped me because part of my job helping student veterans was I would do this one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with them. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to see the problems in other people, but harder in yourself. And then when I was doing these coaching sessions, I saw firsthand the struggles they were facing and it led to me making a list of uh, John's college tips and I would give it to student veterans, you know, when they came in came into school. And then the tips eventually morphed into chapters in my book. So I wrote the book when I was still in my undergrad. And at that point, I was doing well enough in school that I said, you know, what the hell, I'll apply to Harvard. So I kind of applied there half expecting not to get in. And even people that I told I was applying there, they laughed at me, you know, they were like, I said, I'm, I'm gonna apply to Harvard. One of the professors I asked at my school for a recommendation letter laughed at me. I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go ask somebody else. <laughs> like, so, but that kind of, you know, reminds you that you got to push on through, through that stuff because some people might not want you to see your potential. That is definitely a rise to the challenge moment and overcoming that obstacle or that barrier, because a lot of times with Harvard, it's one of those where they kind of look at the outside of a person and not really the inside, the internal feeling of that person. And you're definitely one of those people that shows that you can accomplish anything if you put your mind to it and you go for it. And I kind of like that because I consider myself a wild card where you're not, you can look at me and think one way, mm -hmm. but I'm going to be the complete opposite and show you and prove you wrong. Is that kind of the mentality you had? You had maybe not a person you're trying to prove wrong, but all the people that maybe doubted you to get into Harvard. Well, when I got that acceptance letter, I definitely wanted to go print it out and wave <laughs> it in everyone's face and say, you know, take this or whatever. And, you know, because at the end of the day, it, it took me a little bit to uh, to figure it out. But the worst they could do is say no. And, I'll, yep. and then I'll just, I'll go do something else. Um, but- for me, I wanted to be around, I was so used to being around um, committed and motivated and driven people when I was in the military, especially in units that I was in, that when I got to college, 
everyone, you know, I was kind of around like college freshman type people who were, you know, in school. It didn't really feel like they, they weren't all there with the same focus and intensity that I had for my education. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I go to Harvard, I'll meet kind of more like-minded people who are really trying to work hard to improve the world. So I applied for the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And at the time, I wanted to do uh, international education, which is what I applied for because of my experiences in Afghanistan. With the stereotypes that you have with how hard Harvard is, what was it for you? Did you what was your favorite part of that experience? It was definitely the people that um, that I met there who were, you know, just you know, my peers were just people who are really motivated to do these all these interesting things. My best, uh, my best friend I met there, um, uh, a guy named Tala, he's from Africa. And after meeting him, we went to school, I went to Africa with him and worked a little bit. Now I work part time with his organization, Foundation for a Healthier Senegal. And I've never been to Africa in my entire life. You know, I went over there, and I'm out kind of in rural Africa, helping out with rural education and healthcare, all because, you know, I bumped in this guy at Harvard, we became friends had some classes together. So I think that having you know, you meet people there who just is such a diverse and international background is really interesting. And it's not, I think people look at it like, uh, it's hard to get in. It's not really hard to graduate. Interesting. Because it's a business and they're charging you like 60 grand to go there. So, you know, they, yeah. they got to, they got to pass people. <laughs> otherwise it's not worth it. But I'm lucky because the, the GI bill and the government paid for my education. So I didn't have to pay anything. And that's one thing that made me write my book combat to college is because a lot of veterans who can go to college for free choose not to. Whereas obviously, you know, lots of people plunge themselves deep into debt in pursuit of a college degree. Yeah. And, or they go into debt and they don't even utilize their degree at all, which is even, which is even worse. Right. Cause at least if you're a veteran, you're like, well, I didn't pay for it. So, you know, <laughs> I end up doing something else. It's whatever. If they said no, kind of like a fun question. If they said no, where would you go next? What would be that next college? Um, I applied to uh, Harvard and I applied to Georgetown and Vanderbilt. And I actually got into all three of them. Oh, wow. So you had so was, basically a choice. Yeah. So if I didn't get into any of them, then I was planning on going to Asia to teach. Okay. You talked about when you made those tips for student veterans and how those developed into chapters. What was the conversation like when you were introducing yourself to the other student veterans? Well, I was, um, it was kind of cool because I did everything from like when student veterans would come in, I'd give them campus tours, I'd help certify their benefits so they would get, you know, make sure they got their money for the, for the books and everything. And then you kind of start talking to people and a lot of the things that I kind of took as just kind of from being in the military, I, was, I, I told people, you need to take that into the classroom. So one thing you do in the military is you always sit in front. Mm -hmm. You sit right up front. There's no one, no empty seats behind you. So I tell every veteran, hey, sit in the front seat in the middle in all your classes. You're not going to be distracted by other students. You're there to learn. You can pay attention. You know, other students, they're going to be on Facebook on their laptops. They're going to be on their cell phones, all of those things. You don't do that. And, you know, and then hearing kind of like people, people's responses uh, to some of the tips that I was giving, enough people were like, I'll just write a book about this, you know, because every tip I'd have, I'd also have like a story about it. So, you know, some of my stories, uh, you know, about because some of the disabilities that veterans face in the classroom, sometimes dealing with political professors is hard because there, there can be an anti-military sentiment that can come from mm -hmm. professors and classmates that student veterans can struggle with. Do you feel when you started introducing yourself and really giving those tips that they kind of set, found a sense of trust and bond with you where they could tell you anything and you were able to kind of communicate like them going to someone who didn't have that experience like you did? Yeah, and that's why, you know, a lot of times the uh, like the healthcare and the therapy the VA does sometimes isn't effective because the people you're talking to might, you know, if they didn't serve, they might they might just not get it. So people would be more open. I would be open with sharing my story, including my struggles with alcohol and pills and all those types of things. And I think that made people more likely to trust me. And I was, you know, a combat veteran, like a lot of them, I had, you know, seen my fair share of things had my fair share of ribbons 
So when I tell them things like, listen, if you don't know something, ask. Professors love that. So one of my chapters in my book is don't be afraid to look stupid because you, you're there to learn. So ask all the questions you can possibly think of and you'll be better off. That's even for any student. You always mm -hmm. want to ask because if you're thinking of a question, most likely there's another student in there that is thinking something similar, but no one's going to ask if it doesn't get said. All the time. That happens in classrooms all the time, especially if a professor says, does anyone have any questions? Anyone not understand? No one's going to raise their hand because nobody wants to look like the odd man out. But one thing that you know you have to do is take your education seriously and form a relationship with your professor, especially if you're going to a smaller school. You have these people who are supposed to be you know, your mentors and things like that. You have to utilize them. Did you have a mentor in education? Someone yeah, I had a mentor who was actually an advanced student veteran who was uh, a senior uh, just when I was starting out, and she was a fellow veteran as well. So she started telling me things that I, I probably wouldn't have thought of myself, just kind of little stuff like you should never hand anything in unless someone else has read it. So every time, so then I formed a little group inside the student veteran club where we would share papers with one another and say, hey, just read this over. And then when you know, you're reading someone else's writing, you can kind of tell, oh, you made some mistakes here or, you know, things like that. So little tips and tricks in college that help a lot, uh, I wouldn't have thought of without our help, as well as things like, you know, I, ha I had to give a presentation and I remember coming in and she was like, okay, first off, you need to go home and change because, you know, you need to look good if you're going to be up front of class talking. And that was something I also didn't really think too much about, but the military puts a lot of effort into how you look you know, you, you need to mm -hmm. look the part. So when I got to school and I'm standing up there giving a presentation, even if the presentation is not that good, if I'm wearing a suit and tie, I look better than the guy who's given <laughs> a bad presentation in, or a good presentation in the sweatpants or something. I'd be the person in the sweatpants knowing me. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you give real good presentation, it doesn't matter. But if they're equal, the guy, the person better dressed is always going to sound more intelligent. When you have readers reading your book, is it mostly people that have that military background, military experience in the military, or are you finding people that maybe it's a family member with someone that they know or someone that maybe it doesn't fit with them at all? A lot of the, um, you know, some of the things I've gotten responses from people who like are college athletes who, okay. you know, think categories of people like that who might have come across the book and in, in different areas, um, you know. I wrote the book ideally thinking about first year student veterans, but for anyone in the military community, um, and it's a good book, you know, like a lot of the college tips or college tips doesn't really matter who they're to. Mm -hmm. Like you can take advantage of knowing some information about college if you're going to school or not. So I would think uh, I've gotten some responses from uh, different non-traditional students, you know, people with disabilities, people who go back to school older who might have trouble relating to their classmates. So I've gotten a few interesting emails from people who have come across come across the book. Kind of a fun topic. We kind of hit on it before, but you're covered in tattoos. And when I saw photos on your profile, I was just like, there's a bunch of stories that are the meeting of those tattoos. Talk about being those meetings. What do they represent for you? And how have they played a big impact in your life? Well, I actually, uh, I wrote an article about tattoo therapy for veterans and it's on my website because kind of tattoo culture in the military are, are kind of somewhat intertwined. The first tattoos that, um, that military tattoo is actually Jap Japanese samurai that tattooed their village on their body. So they would know where to take the body back. Uh, so I think it's kind of like it's something that is a transformational therapy for me, because once you go into a tattoo, you're always kind of a different person when you come out, you have mm -hmm. something new on you. And a lot of military people get, you know, their units tattooed on them, different everything from like RIP tattoos, different stories of things. And it's also kind of a mark of where you've been. So I have some tattoos that represent represent my time living in Tennessee. I have some tattoos that represent my time living in New York. I have some tattoos that represent, you know, my combat experiences, some that represent the close friendships that I had, as well as some of like my military experiences. But for me, you know, tattoo therapy is something that uh, something I'm passionate about. When you were growing up, did you ever think you would get a tattoo? No, my my mother uh, was a judge growing up. 
uh, so she didn't have a good view of tattoos because she just saw criminals who were tattooed in, in front of her all the time. So she was, she lost her mind when I got my first tattoo and now it's just, it's too far gone where, you know, <laughs> there's, there's nothing, there's nothing to be done. So now, you know, if, you know, I think last time I saw her, I got my, I had a big new tattoo on my foot and she's like, it eventually you're going to run out of space. <laughs> That's true. I mean, there's only a certain amount of body parts left that you can't. Yeah. Tattoo. So now I'm I'm at like 80 80 percent coverage. So and and I'm not gonna do my hands or my face because the you know Harvard graduate thing. I got to go be yeah. respectable sometimes and go talk to people about my writing. And you know one day I might have to get a real job if this writing thing doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> With your tattoos, what is your favorite one that you've gotten done from um, the I artwork would, standpoint? Um, I would say probably my okay artwork standpoint um well, i'm gonna say probably this symbol that i have right behind me a tori so that's i have a big tattoo of that on my side with the sword through it and it's called a tori it's a symbol from japan and before my in japanese you know culture warriors used to walk through one side of the tori before going off to war mm -hmm. and the idea they'd walk underneath it and would cleanse them of their fears it would cleanse them of their worries so it could go off and fight and die bravely and then when you come back from war you walk through the other side of it and the idea was that it would cleanse you from your combat experiences from the horrors you saw so you could come back and be a farmer or be a husband or whatever else so before my deployment to afghanistan my unit would make this show where he'd walk underneath the Tory and that would symbolize kind of like us going to war. So when you go uh, to Fort Campbell, Tennessee, where I was stationed at for a period of time, they have those giant Tories that are as big as houses kind of mm -hmm. everywhere. So it feels like you're kind of like in Lord of the Rings or something. So I'd say that's my most meaningful tattoo. And it represents, you know, my friends who I lost over there and as well as the ones that lost from suicide when they came back. Having that Tory in your house, does it have that same kind of feel when you're walking into your home and you see that maybe you're not walking underneath it, but still the symbolism is there? Yeah, I think it's important to, you know, have have your living space be something that inspires you. So like right now, uh, as far as uh, I'm working on programs, connect people with uh, who have trauma to nature. That's one of the reasons I'm in the Dominican Republic is because I have the ocean, jungles, mountains, things like that. So I have lots of plants in my house because just being around that type of environment really makes me feel good. We talked about your career, but personally for you, how has that played an effect with the trauma and stuff? Are you able to connect with people? Are you able to still go enjoy what you want to do? Yeah, I, you know, I have, like I, like I mentioned earlier, I did go through kind of some, some dark times, especially when I first got out of the military, but kind of pursuing my own form of therapy is what I feel like made me into who I am today because mm -hmm. the reality of therapy is sometimes it's not always as helpful as we want it to be. There's not, yep. you know, a lot of the onus is on you. There's not a magic pill you can take. There's not some perfect therapist. A lot of therapists, you know, might not be all be the excellent therapist or they might not be a good match for you. Um, so a lot of times I feel like veterans have kind of become over medicated and under helped uh, PTSD shouldn't be looked at like a forever problem because it's something that that can be kind of worked through and better and things like that and a lot of people once they're they have that diagnosis or they have that kind of label on them it's easy to kind of slide into like a victim mentality and kind of blame everything on that because one thing that I've noticed for veterans is the military is kind of a convenient scapegoat mm -hmm. you can always be like oh I'm, you know, an alcoholic because of this, or I'm, I can't keep a job because of this, and it, it kind of all blame it on the military and the government. So not every problem is a mental problem. And that's something that took me a while to kind of figure out some problems are just problems and you have to deal with them, you know, uh, but I think that it, it's still a journey. I mean, I still have problems, but helping people has really provided a purpose for my life, helping other veterans and people with trauma overall. I think a lot of people can relate to that, even if it's not military or trauma specific, but even anything that they're going through that it's something that maybe they wish it could be a snap of the finger and it's gone, 
but they learn so much about themselves through the journey of overcoming. And especially for me, going on 16 years as a diabetic. And when I first started, it was the roughest point because I was a middle schooler. And mm. now I'm in my 20s and I'm really learning what I could have done, but how I can take those things and utilize it today. But even when I do the show this time or when I'm doing a show, I learn about other people's stories and how they're overcoming those challenges and it's taking them time. But they're learning so much. And I can tell that you're passionate about your mission and that you want to help so many people. And that's your goal. You want to be able to make an impact if it's small or if it's large, because you have that experience, you've gone through it. And it's just awesome to see. Yeah, I think a lot of people look at problems, especially in today's society, we're more look, we're more likely to look at these grand problems and be mm -hmm. like, oh, there's just nothing I can do about this. I can't do yeah. anything about, you know, but it's not really, it's just, about having a small positive impact. I mean, you know, I couldn't win the war in Afghanistan, but maybe I can help some veterans coming home. And as long as I help a few veterans, you know, through my writing, I'm I'm going to be happy. Uh, you know, kind of like going back to advice my grandmother gave me is just do a few nice things every day and the world will be a, a slightly better place. You talked about living in the Dominican Republic. What's that next location you would want to live in and experience? You talked about you have no, you have the freedom to do what you want. Where is that next destination? Or do you not know at this point? Uh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I'm thinking I'd like to go to Japan because the, okay. the tour, yeah. some, I like the Japanese culture and everything. So I'm thinking about going there. It's a little more expensive than the Dominican Republic. One of the things <laughs> why I live here, like over 20,000 veterans actually live here in Dominican Republic, because once you retire from the military, obviously your pension's not it's not enough to get a, a uh, flat in New York City or anything like that. So, and they have uh, different foreign medical programs where you can get, you know, medical care even here. That's interesting. I mean, that a lot of people are in the Dominican Republic from military experience. Was that something that you knew about before or did someone introduce you about that location with other veterans being there? Well, I, just, I discovered it actually because I was... Um, I was living in Boston at the beginning of the pandemic and I was finishing up graduate graduate school at Harvard. And then they told us, you know, they came out and said, Hey, uh, you're not going back in person, you know, kind of when the mm -hmm. pandemic was going on. And I was like, well, I don't want to stay in Boston because it's cold and I'm here for school, you know? So I have this kind of dorm room type apartment. And at the time I was like, God, you know, I don't want to go back to Iowa and live with my mother. That sounds worse than anything else. <laughs> So I had a friend who I was in the military with and he's he's Dominican and he says, come down here. And I said, he goes, well, the you know, the military pays for your housing during school and everything. And it's it's a lot cheaper than Boston. So I said, you know, I basically said, OK, I came down here. I started learning Spanish and now I can do a little bit more than order order beer, but not not too much. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's kind of like one one or two new words a day. Get a little better conversation. but. uh I think a lot a lot more people are turning to live abroad to experience new things, especially when you can do so much work now from computers that there's the digital nomad thing has kind of really taken off. I think you're so right. A lot of at home off office, basically jobs are out there and it's giving the people the freedom to live what where they want, give them the opportunity to do what they want. So I totally agree with that statement. Yeah, and I've I've really, you know, been had a great time living here i've really connected with nature i can go out to the jungle i can swim in the ocean and things like that and that's one thing i've discovered in in pursuing my own forms of therapy is for me nature has kind of been more healing than like medication where i really feel like i'm part of something greater than myself i really you know embrace kind of the mindfulness and meditative stuff i get from being out uh and you know in the jungle so i really found that nature has you know a lot of healing properties that traditional medicine just can't really compete with looking at your complete journey you've been on is there anything you would have changed or do you feel that everything you've gone through has gotten you to where you are today and become the person you have become i probably could have done without the the first marriage that, oh, <laughs> that. we didn't even talk about that <laughs> <laughs> um but you know, I don't know. That's a good question. 
uh, I think that everything is experience to learn from. So I'm happy with, you know, even bad tattoos I've gotten, you know, kind of covered in some trailer park type tattoos. You know, it's all kind of part of the journey and everything. Um, I was I was really happy with my military experiences. I think sometimes people don't have the great best experience in the military. So being able to give back, you know, uh, to the veteran community has has really meant a lot. And now I'm kind of opened up and passionate about so many things in my writing. And one of those things is helping to close the gap between the military and civilian population. So that's one of the reasons why I'm, you know, started to do podcasts and talk about my book and everything, because I feel like there is a divide, uh, you know, between the two groups. And I want to see what I can do to close it. I think definitely for someone like me being an outsider, it's hard to know what veterans go through because I don't have that experience. And I think I appreciate the time that you've taken to teach everyone that's listening and even myself about those experience because now we can feel and learn more and be able to be an ally in those situations. So I appreciate because a lot of people don't know. And now they're able to learn and be able to be open about those experiences, about what they're going through. Yeah, I think a lot of people are are kind of hesitant. I think people turn, they like turning to the, to the government, to Congress for use of the military. But obviously, as veterans, we want the population involved. And a lot of people think that, you know, sometimes questioning the military can be looked at as like unpatriotic, but it, it certainly shouldn't be, um, you know, kind of going to war and remaining at war should be painful for the entire nation. And the disconnect between, you know, the the civilian and military groups is kind of what allowed the conflicts to go on so long because it's out of sight, out of mind. People aren't getting tax for them. There's no draft. Mm-hmm. So it kind of allowed this prolonged conflict to continue, I think, uh, for too long. So w- oh. people have kind of an odd view of the military, I think. I think sometimes we're looked at as heroes and you know, like G.I. Joe or Captain America while we're serving, as soon as you take the uniform off, you're kind of look at as like, you know, Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump or something like that, you know, kind of all PTSD or alcoholics. And that's why, you know, I try to encourage veterans to tell our stories because Hollywood's not going to tell our story accurately. Yep. And we, you know, we should find better ways to connect with our civilian population. Is it hard when those like show TV shows or Hollywood kind of depict it in the wrong way? And then that's what the public thinks is that's what you've gone through and things like that. When they're only showing because it's a movie, it's a TV show. They got to get people to watch. Yeah. And I think that that portrayal of veterans has not not been super helpful for us. Um, I'd like to. But again, like you said, it's it's entertainment, and I think that a lot of a lot of veterans are constantly portrayed as alcoholics or having bad PTSD, and there has been a lot of statistics have shown that the civilian population thinks pretty much the veterans are just ingrained with PTSD, that they all have these you know terrible flashbacks, things like that. But that's not really the case, and I think part of that's because less people have a connection with the military than ever before, especially mm-hmm. with less than one percent. One percent of the uh, population serving, and also eighty percent of the people that serve come from military families. So you kind of have this small s- subset of the population that's, you know, shouldering the burden. So what I'd like to do, you know, what I work in education is, I think every child in America during their education should take a trip to, like, a field trip to America's military bases, and you can see American service people in action. You can learn about technology first aid, physical fitness, and things like that. Um, So I think that would be a good first step. So what does the future look like for you? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years, both personally and professionally? Well, I have uh, have my book, which I'm working on promoting now, and I have another uh, challenge book coming out uh, in December. So I have a student veteran semester journal, uh, which is takes vet, student veterans through a 16 week semester. And each each week has a different task, a tip, a goal, and it also has like a weekly schedule as well as like a monthly budgeting planner because your economic health obviously plays a lot into your mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have my book, Combat to College, which I'm working on promoting now. And then I have my, uh, I'm calling it Victor Veteran Challenge that's gonna come out like December. And then next year I have another book coming out uh, with the University of North, North Georgia Press, my publisher. 
are you always coming up with a new book? I like hearing that. that you're <laughs> always coming up with a new idea because it's taking what needs to be out there so people can learn. Yeah. And then I have, you know, my blog, uh, which my website is John H Davis writer.com. So if people want to go on there and read some of my articles, uh, you know, I'd love that. And for anyone to connect with me for any, any issues, uh, PTSD, trauma, civilian military gap, or just say hi is good too. <laughs> or if you want to, if you want some vacation tips, I, I can give you some of those. <laughs> the final question I'll ask you for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? I would say that nothing, nothing great is ever necessarily done alone. That's something that I learned. Um, I have a chapter in my book called Build Your Armor, which is all about building a support system around yourself. So who you surround yourself with really, really matters. Your environment really matters, and you need people to support and help you. So when you find your goals, you should tell people about them. You should let people help you. You should enlist allies. You should work as a team. Because uh, even though they're your goals, other people have uh, an impact on whether you get there or not. So I would say even though life feels more and more like an individual game, the more you can make it into a team mission, the better off you'll be. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thanks a lot, Alex. I appreciate it.